All right, let's go ahead and get started with lecture 17. So what I'd like to cover today is a couple of things about program assignments and quizzes. Uh, I wanna back up to a question I believe Mazda had about tree backups and the bias with those, and then go ahead and get on to lecture 17. And I apologize. Um, but my computer is ringing even though it's on do not disturb. Okay, so for program assignment four, several people had an issue where the probability function in the policy, so this was an epsilon greedy policy, uh, and there was a probability function, right, for what is it? It's a probability of an action given a state, as I remember, right? And so this should be for an epsilon greedy algorithm, epsilon for the non max action and one, sorry, epsilon divided by the number of actions or one minus epsilon plus one plus epsilon over the number of actions for the last one. But anyway, here's what people did. A lot of times what people did is they said return int of A equals equals, what is it, action for uh, S, all right? Yeah, sorry, this is one possibility people had. A second, so can everyone see why this would not be good? Right, because this is actually gonna return either one or zero, which is not really the probabilities that your epsilon greedy policy has. Your epsilon greedy policy actually has a non-zero probability for everyone. So two problems with this. Problem number one, it's either zero or one. So that's clearly not epsilon greedy. And problem number two is it's stochastic, right? When you call this over and over again with the same state and action, it may return different values. Sometimes it'll return zero, sometimes it'll return one, depending on what happens in action four, which itself is probabilistic, right? Because it's rolling the dice to see whether it's part of, it's greedy or not, or it's uh, exploring. A slightly better version of this would be to say something like if A equals equals action for S, then return one, whatever that is, some algebra there. Otherwise, return one divided by a length of self dot actions. And it's not one, that's actually epsilon. That's not an eraser. This is not erasing, that's weird. Okay, epsilon over number actions. So the problem here still is, it fixes that it's either zero or one because it's correct, correctly going to be one divided by epsilon for all but one of the actions and the remaining probability for the final action. The problem is it's still stochastic, right? Because this guy is stochastic. And so what you really want to be saying is if A equals max, you know, action for S or something like that, you want to be doing the max a computation that should be depending on Q and should have nothing to do with calling any random number generators. Does that make sense? Kaki, does that explain that to you for your issue? Okay, so common problem, I don't know, a third of people probably had this, let's say. Okay. All right, uh, that takes care of that. Now let's look at program assignment five. So one question is, I have had several people talk about how their computation is taking much longer than what mine took. So I just pointed out that mine took a couple of minutes, two minutes something. Um, I didn't mean to say that yours should take two minutes, just that two minutes was achievable. And also I didn't do any optimization. I just went ahead and wrote the code according to the pseudocode, just kind of vanilla, wrote it out. I didn't use NumPy or anything, 
just kind of wrote it out, didn't bother having a fixed size array for the states and rewards that I then used mods in. I just kept adding every time you hit a new state and reward, adding to the state and reward arrays. Um, and it ran in a, a couple minutes. So I didn't bother doing any optimizations. If you're finding it takes much longer, so I've had people say it takes 50 minutes or an hour and a half, there are several things you can do. One thing you can do is uh, figure out why it's taking so long. So perhaps run a profiler uh, on your Python code to see. A second thing you can do is reduce the resolution of your um, graph. So if you look at your if you look at your graph for a given n, you may have something that looks like this, right? And this is the alpha values here. Well, this is a nice smooth looking graph because we have, we're taking alphas very often. Um, if you wanna go ahead and take alphas less often, you can do that. And you might get a graph that's gonna look like, you know, something like that. So more um, piecewise linear right less smooth that's fine don't make a graph that looks like this you know with three lines to it um, but if you've got something that roughly shows what we want then that's okay so that's another way you can do it there's if on the other hand your thing takes an hour and a half but it got you your figure and you're done that's fine i'm not going to be rerunning it i'm not going to be testing to see how long it takes so just fine but don't get yourself in a position where you're needing to have a lot of our turnarounds where you're making a lot of changes because that's just uh, a pointless waste of time. Any questions on that? Uh, let me also bring up my chat so I can see if there are any chat questions. I actually had a quick question about um, uh, the problem. I heard a quick question about, and then you cut out. Uh, the uh, probability function. Yep. Go um, ahead. Why is it one for the max action? Shouldn't it be, isn't it like one minus epsilon? It's one plus... dot, dot, dot. Okay, okay. There's some other shit there. So yeah. Cool, I just, one just I, one's double check. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I still need to figure out how to show the chat. And there's the... Still trying to figure it out. Uh, give me one more minute. All right, I can't find it, so I am going to rely on someone to tell me if any chats come up and We'll deal with it then, okay? All right, the next thing I wanna talk about was quiz six. So uh, number one, I think everyone got right, which was that n step TD methods span a spectrum from Monte Carlo at one end to one step TD at the other, and that is true. Okay. Uh, number two, so if you're using an n step TD method with n equals four, so you just took action at from state st at time step t receiving award rt plus one what's the most recent q value because it now can now be updated so remember we need four time steps uh, in order to calculate a q value right so we certainly cannot calculate this one right this one can't be right because we only have one reward right and we need four steps so that one can't be right and certainly we can't calculate something that's in the future when we've only just received our reward and we don't even know what action we're going to take. Uh, and then figuring out which one is right in the past, basically it's either t minus four or t minus three. And the way I look at it is like this. If n is one, then if we've just taken action at from state st and returned reward t plus one, then we can basically say q of st at plus equals, um, 
alpha times RT plus one plus um, so on, right? So at one, we can do STAT. Therefore, two must be T minus one, three must be T minus two, and four is T minus three. So that's where we get this one. Questions on that? So I'm finding a lot fewer questions in this online video than in, in the classroom. And I wanna try and encourage as many questions as I can, even in this format. So make it just like you're asking a question in the class. Don't, uh, don't hold yourself to a higher standard than you would in the classroom. Okay. Uh, Prof. Rhodes? Yeah. I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, don't you still need the value of Q or like which action you're going to be taking at the next time step? Like, or are we just assuming that it's going to be the, that we can use this, the max method? Like, are we, are we assuming this is sort of like a Q learning? Oh, I see. So you're saying if you were, um, so if you're doing an in-step SARSA, then you would need to know A prime and S, sorry, ST plus one and AT plus one in order to do this calculation here. Mm -hmm. And so therefore you're saying you couldn't actually calculate ST minus three, AT minus three. Is that right? I think that's what I'm saying, yes. Okay. That is a reasonable argument that basically, so if you're using SARSA and step SARSA, okay. Okay, I don't understand why my eraser doesn't work. There it is. That here, right, let's just go ahead and fill this in. So this would be RT plus one plus what? Q, Q of ST plus one, AT plus one minus Q of ST, AT, right? And so in the one step case, you couldn't really do this yet until you figured out what your new action was. Um, so that is a reasonable argument for B also being correct, that a C would be correct for Q learning, and this would be correct for SARSA. So given that, I will go back and regrade and give credit for both. Thanks, Nick. Other questions? Okay, uh, here, this says assume the maze. Um, so this left out a little bit, and let me just quickly go and grab what the previous part of this uh, quiz was. Okay, so this, had basically Rose, just to let you know Varun wrote something in the chat what did it say he said I think the end step TD refers to just the prediction step right not to the control step which would be SARS or Q learning or whatever um, in step TD can be either it's not necessarily prediction or uh, Q learning, I don't think, as far as the in-step TD, right? We could we could be looking at that for either. So there is certainly a distinction between control and prediction. Nothing in the question is asking which is which. All right, 
the lead in to this 3A and 3B that somehow I don't have on this was assume 10 step TD. Um, and this is for a maze problem. And all state values start at zero. All right, so that's our assumption here. So we have a discount factor in part A of gamma equals 0 0.9, and we give zero reward for everything but leaving, and one more reward when you leave, right? So remember, this is one of the two ways we can set up a maze where we try and make it hurry through the maze. Uh, one way is a discount and give it a reward when you leave, and then in B, we'll look at the other approach where we um, penalize every step it stays in. So in this case, we have an episode of length 100, right? So we've got a maze, we've got a start, We've got it end, it goes around, and eventually leaves, right? And the question is, what's the maximum number of non-trivial state value updates? So non-trivial meaning we don't just set zero to zero, right? So let's say we look at uh, our beginning state, right? Right here. So that can only be updated after 10 steps, right? So after 10 steps, then we can update that first one. But it's still gonna be zero because the reward all along the way is zero and our final state value is zero. And so this guy is gonna get updated to zero. And similarly, this one's gonna get updated to zero and this one's gonna get updated to zero all the way through. Everything gets updated to zero until what happens? Right, until we get to, let's say, 10 from the end. And that's gonna get updated to what? We're gonna have our reward of, let's say, what, R91 plus gamma R92 plus R1, and maybe off by one here, let's say one, uh, one gamma to the, This will be what, uh, one, two, three, four, ninth, I guess. I may be off by one here. But in any case, we'll go ahead and update that tenth from the end, right? And then the ninth from the end, the eighth from the end, the seventh, all the way to the last one. Do you agree with that? Does that make sense? So we'll update 10 of them, right? If we had a t an end step of one, right, and we're one, then we'd only update that very last state that led to the end state. So I'll mark in green these ones here. So the last 10 get updated to non-zero. Now, if we have the maze problem where our reward is negative one every time we stay in and it's zero when we escape. So we basically keep getting hit on the head uh, every time we move and eventually uh, we stop getting our head hit and it feels good. Then the question is how many non-trivial updates are there? So let's again look at the same thing. We have our start state, we have our end state, we take a step, we can't update this yet, right? We have to wait at least 10 steps to update it. So we go, you know, 10 steps. And now we can go ahead and update, right? Because our rewards are gonna be negative one all along the way. So we're gonna have negative one plus uh, a discounted negative one plus a twice discounted negative one plus a, all the way up to a nine or 10 discounted negative one, ninth discounted negative one. So state, the first state will now be uh, a negative number rather than zero. And the same thing is gonna happen for every state along the way. So that's why we're gonna get a 100 here. Questions uh, on that? Prof Rhodes. Yeah. Uh, I still don't entirely understand why 
you you will be updating S T minus four and A T minus four. Can you explain that again? So okay, so back to problem number two. Yes. Okay, so here's the reason. Um, <coughs> if we're using SARSA, then our formula is this, right? Uh, for, the, for the undiscounted uh, n equals one step, yes, yes. Okay, yeah, so in this case, when n is equal one, we can't actually update STAT because we don't yet have, right? This is the last action we have. We took this action at this state. And one can argue we, know, we don't yet have AT plus one. We haven't chosen AT plus one yet. Until we choose AT plus one, we can't update QSTAT. So it's a... Um, I guess what I would say, let's see. So when we look at the SARSA pseudocode, right? The SARSA pseudocode basically says, choose the next AT plus one before we calculate Q of STAT. And the way this question is worded, it kind of leaves open whether we've chosen AT plus one yet. So that's why I'm leaving this B kind of open. Maybe we'll just put it as SARSA question mark, okay? because I can see why people might have thought uh, SQ AT minus four, ST minus four. Uh, okay, I see that. Um, but I would say this, in both of the algorithms, both SARSA and Q learning, in the end step, the, the way the pseudocode is written, at the time we're updating Q, we are updating for N equals four, Q of ST minus three. A of T minus three. Okay. Because of the fact that in the SARSA case, they choose the action beforehand. And if you remember, that was the difference between the SARSA and the Q learning is that the Q learning actually chooses the action after you update the Q instead of before right. the Q. Uh, I actually had one more quick question. Go ahead. Uh, is, it's that for temporal difference learning, uh, the book seems to treat TD as like learning the value function. And then the, uh, the uh, SARSA as different from TD as like learning the uh, action values. So in our case, are we saying that like TD, when we're talking about temporal difference learning, are we also uh, using the fact that you're learning the Q values? Yeah, in, so in step, uh, in any case where you've basically got a, a update, of a state value pair based on an, uh, another state value pair from a, from a previous time step, sorry, from, from the next time step is a form of temporal difference learning. That is STAT and STAT plus T plus one and AT plus one is the temporal difference. And um, so we would apply that to N step either one step or in step Q learning, one step or in step SARSA, would all be a forms of temporal difference learning. Okay, okay. Okay, and okay. expected SARSA too, and tree backup. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, tree backup as well, because we're again using this, 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 this bootstrapping mechanism. So, any other questions? And given that there are a variety of n-step TD methods, is there a sort of neat way to describe the like n-step sort of like classic n-step TDs? It's just value, like state values. Um, sorry, so state values rather than action values. Mm -hmm. So it's like what the book sort of refers to when it's talks about TD, yeah, TD, sort of as its own algorithm that's just... Yeah, that's just this prediction algorithm values. rather than the control algorithm. Um, I'm sorry, so the question is, is there... 
just like what do you call that if saying oh, end step td is referring to the whole family what do you call the, like just the... i'd call that in step td control i'm sorry prediction control. yeah wait what <laughs> prediction right prediction right so pred right prediction is calculating the the state values uh, and we can say control is the action values. So what you're doing for program assignment five, right, is, is, is the prediction problem. Okay, so that's the quiz. Uh, tree backup. Let me switch something for a moment. Okay, so we had a question that came up um, on Monday, which was about the tree backup, right? So we have Let's just look at a simple example. And then let's look at the difference between the tree backup uh, and let's look at, what should we look at? Let's, let's look at uh, on policy an on policy update, all right, where we would take, so the on policy up, equivalent update, would be here, right? Uh, so this is tree backup. We know that if we go ahead and use this update, right? So that'd be basically Q of, you know, STAT plus equals gamma squared Q of ST plus two, AT plus two, right? We agree on this one. So, right, we're taking two rewards into account and then we're taking our final uh, value into account. So I do have dogs. And they normally stop barking when I yell at them to shut up, so. Okay, so um, that's this case. If we look at the tree backup, right, that'll be different. Q, S, T. Hey, stop. So here we're going to get an RT plus one. This is RT plus two. And here we have RT plus three, right? So we're going to take RT plus one and we're going to um, So how do I want to do this? I guess here's what I want to do. So let's assume initially Q equals zero for all S and A. Okay, so we're equal zero and we have an equal probable policy. All right, and we would get a reward, let's say of, um, so we have our state action, we get our RT plus one, 
we get our our t plus two. Okay. In this case, our new q is going to be equal, and let's give these numbers. Let's give this 10 and this 10, and we'll be undiscounted just to make it easy. So our new q is going to be alpha times 10. Sorry, alpha times 20. So we're going to have the first reward plus the second reward, and we know our final q is 0 because all the q started out as 0. So the new Q is going to be alpha times 20. Let's look instead for the backup. Well, in the backup, what we know is we're going to only take into account here a one-third probability of going down here. So we're still going to get a 10 for our initial reward, but then we're going to get a one-third probability of having chosen I'm sorry, let's see, our RT plus two really, we get after we choose our action. So our RT plus two, we're gonna only get a one third reward, right? So we're gonna basically get, we have a zero reward here, a zero here, a zero here, and a zero here. This is our estimations of our state values, right? And a zero here. Um, so our reward that we're going to get is going to be alpha times our RT plus one plus one third uh, of our RT plus two, right? We're gonna get less of it. The, the, the way I guess we'll look at it is since we're doing an, uh, uh, a weighted sum, we're now weighting in this leaf and this leaf and this leaf and this leaf all as zero. So we're gonna reduce the total reward that we are uh, targeting for this, for this state. So this state is gonna have a lower state value than in the standard on policy end step, right? The, the SARSA, let's say, okay? So the tree backup is gonna be less because we've got all of these other paths that we could have taken, which would have led to zero that we're waiting. So we are waiting the actual path we took less based on the probability of having taken it. And in the, uh, uh, so that's the tree backup case. In the sampling case, we're just taking our sampling and giving it full weight. So therefore, we are more slowly approaching our final uh, state values, right? As we go through and update state values, as we update all the state values in the leaves, then doing this weighted sum is going to be more accurate. Or it, we, it will lead to the same final solution of the same Q values, but it's gonna be slower to get there, as we can see in this example, because we're starting at at zero and we're counting a lot of zeros and counting the actual path we took less based on its probability of occurring. Does that explain the question that you had? I think you had brought that up, Mazda, is that right? Yeah, okay. Any questions on this? All right, so let's get on to um, today's topic, which is gonna be basically model-based learning. So we know we have model-based learning. So where, give me an example, uh, Shannon, let's say, of some algorithm we've used for reinforcement learning that was model-based as opposed to model-free. things that we started with that were dynamic programming in some yeah. way. 
So dynamic programming is a, is, is a great example. And the reason that the dynamic programming was model-based is because we had a summation over P of S, R, S prime, A prime, right? So this was our environment, right? Our MDP environment that we had. And model free is, for instance, let's see, TD is one uh, model free algorithm, including in step and one step and Q learning and so on. Uh, Julius, give me another model free algorithm that we've seen. Model free algorithm. Um, Sarsa? Is it? Yeah, but this includes Sarsa, right? So includes Sarsa, includes Q learning, includes expected Sarsa. Monte Carlo. Okay, Monte Carlo. That's a good one. So Monte Carlo is another one where we basically just sample. We just say, give me an entire episode, and then we'll go ahead and figure out what's going on. Um, I want to distinguish for a moment a model and the environment. Okay. So by the way, I apologize if you downloaded the lecture slides um, because there were some huge size because it turns out this picture uh, is, uh, you know, I got, it is public domain. Um, so that's good, but it's from NASA and it's 20 megabytes or two. It was a very large file. And so this got embedded in my PDF. And so I converted it to JPEG, it's better now. But anyway, this is gonna be our environment. So our environment is what we're actually interacting with. Let's use as an example, I think a robot would be a good example, right? So if we're dealing with a robot, the robot, our, our actions might be moving actuators, let's say, okay? And the, New state and reward could be various things. Let's say, so let's say we are trying to uh, grasp an object, all right? Our state might be what we see in our video camera that shows us uh, both the object and our hand, our robotic hand. And then the act, we have a variety of actuators we can control, including, let's say, the fingers and including moving the arm and so on. And the reward might be, you know, uh, an attaboy if we actually pick up the object we're trying to deal with. That's an expensive, slow operation to take actions in that environment. Okay, we it's part of the reason it's slow is because it's it's real world oriented as opposed to silicon oriented. We've got to actually move actuators, you know, move the hands, do do stuff like that. Okay. As opposed to, let's say, a model. So a model is going to be some simplified version in some case, or maybe just estimate of the real environment. Okay. So this is a distinction we have not made yet. When we talked about model-based algorithms in the past, we assumed we were just given all of the probabilities that tell us how the uh, states and actions lead to subsequent states and rewards and probabilities of those happening. Okay. Now we're going to say, well, there's an environment and implicit in an environment, maybe those probabilities are explicitly, but we don't necessarily know them. We want to learn this model. Okay. That's our idea is we're going to learn a model from the environment. Does that concept make sense? All right, what kind of model? There are two different kinds of models. So a distributional model is the types of MDPs we've seen so far. So this is where we actually have all the probabilities. Okay, so given a state and action, we know the probabilities of the subsequent, uh, uh, you know, state reward pairs. 
okay? So S prime, let's say, comma R. Just in the same way that we did uh, earlier in the class when we were dealing with, let's say, dynamic programming, where we looked at the MVP and we returned this giant, in some cases, dictionary containing for every possible state action pair what the probabilities are of subsequent states and rewards. A sample model is a more constrained model. A sample model says, given an S and an A, it returns a sample S prime R. Okay, so this is, according to the model, a potential next state and reward. So this is more like the MD, MDPs that we have been using in order to generate episodes. It's actually much easier often to, to write a model that just takes a given state in action, rolls a dice, and returns an S prime and an R. Okay, but it's certainly very easy given a distributional model, you can come up with samples, right? So if we have a distributional model, it's easy to come up with samples. It basically just says, take the probabilities for the given state in action and roll weighted dice appropriately to come up with the next state and reward. Okay. You can't go the other way necessarily though. With a sample model, it's much harder to come up with a distributional model. Questions on this so far? Um, someone who worked on Jack's car rental. So let's say Dave. Which is easier for Jack's car rental, distributional model or sample model? Um, what do you mean by easier? Which is like, easier to write? A sample model. Yeah, sample model is a lot easier than calculating all the possible probabilities for all the different states and actions. Plus, if you have a lot of different states and actions, this probability model can get extremely, the distributional model can get extremely large, right? Trying to represent that. So. All right, so what is planning? What do we mean by planning? Right, this is, this is, if we think of learning, you, you can kind of bumble around and get rewards and do things, or you can also think ahead and plan. If I do this, what will happen? And consider. Right? And if I do this, what will happen? You know, so, so if I'm here and I do this, then this will happen. And then, you know, so, so I take an action. I imagine taking an action. When I imagine taking an action, I can then imagine what possible outcomes would be, what possible rewards I might get, what possible states I might end up with. And I can then say, this is like if you're playing chess, right? If you're playing chess, you look and you say, hmm, if I move this pawn here, well, then that would leave my king open, you know, to a check. So maybe I won't do that. If I move this bishop here, then if this other person moved here, then I could move here and so on. And the reason that you can do that is because you actually have a model of chess, right? You know what the, what the, how the pieces move, for example. So planning is this idea of having a model and updating. So given a model, update your policy. Okay. Given a model, Update the policy. How do we normally update the policy, uh, Nelson? What do we normally use to update our policy and all the, uh, uh, the model-free stuff we've been doing so far? 
um, you use the estimates you have for the state values? Okay, so we use the estimates. So this is, let's say, without a model. We use estimates of state values. Yes, and what else? Let's say I start out and I say, our right, estimates are all zero. Okay, how am I gonna update my policy? What do I do? Uh, let me do some exploration. exploration. Okay, exploration in the environment. In the right? environment. Okay. If, if we again have here, we have our environment, our agent, we take an action and we get back a state and a reward. Okay. So we take actions in the environment. And that's all we know how to do, right? We take actions in the environment and that helps us update our queue. But we don't do any thinking ahead or planning ahead at all. And that's the idea with the model is that we're going to, given a model, update the policy without taking actions in the environment, right? So if you think of taking actions in the environment, like, so let's, let's look at chess. So let's bring it back up again. So we're playing chess. Um, one way I can take actions, or sorry, the way I take actions in the environment is I put my finger on a piece and I pick it up and I move it to another square, right? And then I let go of the piece. Um, if that's all I could do, I would be very handicapped in chess because I couldn't say, well, let me think in my head about moving this pawn and consider what will happen and whether I want to do it or not. Okay. So planning would be this idea of I've got a model, I see what the board is, I have an understanding of how actions will affect the future, right? How they'll affect at least what position I'll be in if I move the pawn. And I can consider those and think about those and I can use those to try and update my policy. So we're not gonna take actions in the environment in order to update our policy. So this is what we'll call direct reinforcement learning. You take actions in the environment, you update your policy based on those actions and the subsequent rewards you get. In planning, we have a model and we go through and the way I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest is we take imaginary actions and we get imaginary rewards and states. And that is how we update our policy. We are going to not operate in the real world. We are instead going to operate using our model, which may be imperfect. Crawford, so is yeah. this sort of like off policy? I see like some parallels here. Mm, not really, because in the model, when we are taking imaginary actions, we're going to take imaginary actions based on our policy still. So we could still do on policy. So we'll still use the policy that we're trying to improve to choose actions, but the states and rewards that we're going to get are not real states and rewards. They're imaginary states and rewards. Thank you. Okay. And let me, I think an example may, may help. So, Let's come up with a model, all right? So so let's say we have the following actual experience. Okay, so we have our real episodes. Okay, so we're gonna have, let's see, and in this case, we have two states 
and we the only action is just act okay it's sort of like the random walk where all we do is just act 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 and things happen in our environment so we're gonna do let's say um, we take we're in state a we take our action we get back a reward of zero we're in state b we take an action we get a reward of zero i'm going to just actually write this as a zero b zero okay take action in state a and we get a reward of zero and now we're in state b we get a reward of zero and now we're terminal uh, other so this is one episode another episode let's say b we get a one uh, b we get a one b we get a zero b we get a one b we get a one and b we get a one okay this was an example we actually used uh, quite a bit ago back when we were looking at monte carlo okay so these were our actual episodes that occurred um I am going to actually postpone this for just a, just a, a moment because this is stochastic and I want to make an even simpler example, which is deterministic. Okay, so let's say we've got a maze problem. It's a two by two maze. Okay, and this is the start uh, here and this is the end here. Okay, and we can go up, down, left or right. But we don't know anything about this. But the, and the uh, we'll call the states um, S, E, A, and B. Okay. So one episode might be S up. Right. That is our uh, state and action pair, and that leads us to what A. So actually, let's write it this way up, uh, we're gonna get a zero, uh, we're in state A, we go up, that gives us let's say a zero, we're in state A, we go left, and that gives us a zero, and we're in state A, and we go right, and that gives us a plus one, and we're in the end state. Okay, does that episode make sense? All right, what have we learned what, what could we say about a model of our environment now? What do we know? Okay. If we happen to know this was deterministic, we know this. We know that A up, so this state and action, goes to A S prime and R, a, a new state of A, and a reward of zero, right? And we know all these other things. We know that going left from A takes you to A and gives you zero reward. We know going right from A gives you a reward of one and takes you to the end state. Okay. Do we know anything about B? We've never seen B. We don't, yeah, we've never seen B, so we don't know anything about B. We don't know anything about S other than if you go up, it takes you to A and gives you a reward of zero. But we could keep a big table, okay? This could be our model. Our model could basically be a cross product of S by A going to a cross product of uh, S by R, right? So we could just keep a big table that says, let's say these are our actions, and these are our states. And so here our states are S, A, E, and B. And our actions are up, left, down, and right. And what do we know? We can fill in S and up, and this gives us uh, an A and a zero. And we can fill in A up, gives us an A and a zero. And A left gives us an A and a zero. And A right gives us an E and a one. Do we know anything else? We have four entries here. We have one, two. I still have dogs, four entries here. Okay. 
So you can see we have filled in some information about the dynamics of our environment. Okay, It's missing parts, but we have some information. Right? So this is our model of the maze environment. We chose this representation. This representation only really works well for a deterministic environment because we're basically saying what we're keeping for a given state action pair is what's the last state and reward we got from having taken that state action transition. And so that's very appropriate for deterministic. For non-deterministic, uh, we'd be missing out. Okay, but for deterministic, that's a, a reasonable type of a model. Just keep track of every state action pair and what is the new state and reward that you've seen from making that transition. So questions on that point. All right, I'm gonna come back to this non-deterministic, this stochastic example in just a moment. I wanna show you this queue planning. Okay, so this is not learning. This is planning. And planning, again, uses the model, not the environment. If we have a model of our robotic um, environment, we can try and imagine what happens in there, simulate things that happen in memory, in our computer, much quicker than we can actually work in the physical world. By the way, another reason people don't like using robots is because eventually over time, if you use the robots, right, they, they, they're mechanical issues that happen and so on if you're using them all the time. So there's some advantages in uh, just doing things in simulation. So here's what we're going to do. And this is going to look a lot like queue learning. So we're going to state it, pick a state and pick an action. Like we might pick um, uh, A and up. Okay. And then we're going to send S and A to a sample model. Not the environment, not the actual environment. And now we get back a sample next reward and sample next state, S prime. So it might be A, sorry, A and up gives us back A and zero. And I'm really sorry I chose A as the name of my state, um, but I did. So this is S, this is A, this is S prime, and this is R. And so now we have a policy. Let's say we have some epsilon greedy policy based on Q. We can now go ahead and update Q with the same old uh, update we would normally do. So we take Q of SA and we would take then the uh, max from our new state. And in fact, what, what would we actually get here? So what's R equal to in this case? Um, Mazda? Zero. Yeah, so this is equal to zero. And to keep going, what's S prime equal? S prime is A here. And what's the maximum uh, A? So e. what's the R max of? One, moving to the right, to the terminal state. Why? What the, you have to know, what are the Q values? Do we know Q values yet? Is this based off the previous deterministic example or? This is based on the, that exact previous deterministic example. Whoops, where mm -hmm. did it go? Right, so from our, right our table, taking the arg max of that row, we would see that moving to the right. Ah, us... But this is our model, okay? Oh, okay? When we're taking the arg max, we're taking it for Q. And so we'd have a similar Q Right, so let's see what our Q looks like. Uh, S-A-E-B, S-A-E-B, 
uh, up, left, down, right, up, left, down, right. And to begin with, this is all zeros. So this is not a very useful update that we're going to do because we're going to basically update it to zero, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. However, we're going to loop again. If we loop again and we happen to choose, sorry, I keep going the wrong way. If we happen to choose the state of A and going right, that's going to give us a reward of one. And so that will allow us, if we're in the state of A and go right, to update this Q to be greater than zero, right? And we could do this. With only, right, we took this one real episode. And now we can go ahead and continue doing this looping and updating these Q values using these imaginary um, one step transitions. So, is this if we're doing kind of one, one step Q learning? on our saved information about information that we know about the environment, okay? Which is uh, imperfect, right? Only, collect, only has a subset of what's actually, what is actually true in the real environment. So now that this one is greater than zero, right? That would allow us, if we happen to look at S and up, we can now update S and up so that this is now going to be greater than zero. And we can do that without going back to the environment. So normally if we were doing one step TD, if we ran this episode, it would update the A to the right state. And then we'd have to run another episode, which might allow us to update the S up. Um, but instead what we're doing is saving the information from the episode that gives us information about the dynamics of the environment. And then we can go ahead and think of it as, as replaying, but we're not replaying the episode. Instead, we are just replaying or, or doing single steps from the model. Okay. Imaginary things. So they're not entirely imaginary in the sense that we're basing it off history. We're basing it off real rewards and actions. The, yeah, the imaginary part of it is we're not interacting with the environment while we're doing it. We are using the environment to update our model. That's an important part. And so let's actually look at that picture for just a second. So we take actions, right? So this is actions in the real environment. This gives us some experience, right? Where that experience is, we get a state, we get a reward. The direct reinforcement learning, Q learning, for example, updates the policy. Then we do something else with that experience, right? So this experience is an S prime and an R. We feed that into our model so that we can learn from the model. So that would be as we, for instance, go up from S, here, we find that we have a reward of zero and we're now in A. So we will do that both to update our Q function okay, in a standard Q learning, and we will also go update our state information here on our model. Once we have the model, we can now use the model to do planning, where planning is going to be updating. the value and we could choose to use Q, let's say call it Q planning. We can use all sorts of uh, standard reinforcement learning algorithms that we already have to do that, okay? Like Q learning, we'll just call it Q planning. So here's, what a, here's another way to look at this really. We have our real experience here we 
directly update the value function. We use that real experience to update the model. And then from the model, we simulate experience and we also update our policy. Okay. So we are utilizing our real experience uh, more fully. We're squeezing as much juice out of it as we can. Okay. And that is we are uh, being more efficient in our real experience. And in some cases, that matters a great deal, especially if you're interacting with an actual real world, like a robotic, a robotic arm, right? Or if we've got a you know, race car that's, that's actually uh, uh, robotically reinforcement learning controlled, then as it's taking an action and then getting back some information about state and reward, it may have a lot of dead time in terms of CPU time where nothing else is happening. And so rather than just wasting that CPU time, because it's got, I don't know, let's say 10, 10 milliseconds before it's gonna get a new reading of what's happened and reward and so on, that 10 milliseconds, it could go through and do a, a ton of simulated experience and improve its policy. Okay. One other quick thing yeah. is, would just like replaying TD also fall under the sort of planning? Or is that kind of different? It's, it's, uh, it's kind of different. I mean, you could look at it as, what you could look at it as is, is a model that doesn't give you um, new states. Let me try and describe this as I can. So, Normally when we're doing our planning, our model can give us a new state and reward given an existing state and action. If replaying TD is replaying entire episodes. So replaying an entire episode is less rich than being able to replay just single steps. Because in single steps, you're, you're basically chopping all your episodes just in, into particular steps. And so you're building, a, in some ways, a richer model there, rather than looking at an entire run uh, of an episode. Okay. So let's look at DynaQ. And I still have open to come back to that stochastic model. So really what happens is we go ahead and here we do our direct reinforcement learning. Okay, so there's nothing weird about this. We're in a state. We take maybe some epsilon greedy uh, action, we look at the reward, and we go ahead and update our Q value. This updates the model. So if we have a deterministic environment, we're just basically again, filling in our matrix that we saw before of our state action pair, and we're filling in what our new reward and state are. And then, this is where we're doing planning. Our planning says take a model and update our policy. So we're gonna just go through and pick a state of those that we have seen so far, right? So we don't wanna pick a state we have no information for. Pick an action that we have seen in that state before, and then go ahead and figure out what is the reward and next state for that and update Q based on that. So we're gonna do that in times. We're in maybe 50 or 100 or maybe it's gonna be dependent on how long it takes for the next thing in the environment to happen. So we'll in parallel, let's say, well, we'll just use up whatever CPU time we have until a next thing happens in the actual environment. Okay. So, it sounds pretty simple, and it actually is pretty simple. Okay. The fact that this is assuming a deterministic environment is uh, fairly limiting. We will, we'll still, we'll come back to that stochastic one, but it looks like we won't have enough time to do that today. So I'd like to look at some applications of this. So here's a maze, okay? Our maze, uh, we start at the S, so we start at the start state, and this is our goal state. And again, we don't have a, we don't start with any model of this, okay? 
if we just do direct reinforcement learning, we see this blue curve here. Okay, so this curve starts at episode two. Episode uh, one is a long episode, and it's the same episode that we use for, that happens for both direct learning and also doing planning. Okay, because I should probably put in here the reward equals zero, except at the goal. Right, and we have discount equals, I don't know, 0.9 or something like that. So again, we're trying to hurry it through. So regardless of whether doing planning or not, in that first episode, all our planning is gonna still be useless because all our state values are still zero. So the, the first episode has the same length, no matter whether we're doing planning or whether we're not doing planning. But notice the second episode. So the second episode has more than 800 steps when we're doing direct reinforcement learning because we're basically randomly moving around. However, if we're doing five, just five planning steps, we're down to what is about, I don't know, something under 200 steps. And if we are doing 50 planning steps, we're down around, I don't know, maybe 30 steps for our second episode. And notice how quickly we go down to the optimal. And so what takes us almost 30 episodes to learn in direct reinforcement learning, if we're doing 15 planning steps, we can do in a, a handful of episodes. And if episodes are expensive, if interacting with the real environment is expensive, this is a big win. Let's look at why this is so helpful. So if we're not doing planning, and assuming we're doing one step TD, by the time we finished the first episode, all we learned was one, we updated one state transition, right? We now know that in this state, we, the up is better than the others, right? Because we got to the goal and then we could back that up by one step. If we'd been doing 10 steps, we would have had 10 that would have gotten updated. But if we're only using one step, it only updates one. On the other hand, and so this is halfway through the second episode. Okay, so halfway through the second episode, we have information about basically one state that's non-zero. One state action is non-zero. And this is where we are. That is, we have, we're halfway through the episode and this is what state we happen to be in. On the other hand, this is again halfway on the right hand side. Uh, and we have updated a whole bunch of states, right? Because if you think about it, at the beginning of the second episode, At the beginning of the second episode, even with the n equals 50, this is what it looked like, right? Because we, using our real experience, updated one step back from the goal, the one place we have a non-zero reward, and then we ended the episode. When we got to the beginning of the episode, however, we started in the start state, we took one step, and then we did 50 planning steps. So the 50 planning steps allowed us to fill in some of these um, we actually didn't fill in many of these arrows, right? But if we happen to pick this state as one of our 50, then we could have updated that one. And if we picked this state, we could have updated that one. And then we, so we took one step in real life. And then we took a second step in real life. And each step in real life, we're updating 50 states. Most of the states would have been useless, but it's, we're going to, by chance, start actually getting good ones. And as we fill in more of it, more of the state updates are useful, right? As we have, for instance, filled in down to here, then both of these are now eligible as updates for the next one. And once we've updated these, we can update, you know, going to the right here or up here or up here and so on. 
So by the time we get halfway through the episode, we're at this state and we have got all of these updates. And as we can see, it's mostly sending us a pretty good path, right? So if this is halfway through our episode, uh, we'll somehow have to get to here and then we could go right up, right up, right, 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 up, up, up. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11, about 12, 13 steps. We're halfway through, so we must have taken another 13 to get to here. So 13 plus 13 is about 26. And that about fits with what we're seeing here, that the second episode is somewhere more than 14 and less than 200 steps. Questions on this planning? So are there disadvantages to this method? Because uh, it seems like there's something that should be wrong with it. Like why wouldn't you just always use it over, plan over no planning? So we have two elements. Here's a problem with planning. So the model based. So in the model free, we have one source of uncertainty and that's our Q values, right? Our Q values aren't right. And to the extent that they're wrong as we're updating, we're incorrect. And so we have to correct those. In the model based, we have an additional source of let's call it uncertainty or incorrectness, right? And that is our model as well. So now we're relying not only on an uncertain value function, we're also relying on an uncertain model. On Monday, I'm gonna show you how having the model can um, be a little bit problematic. So we'll look at some cases where, especially if the environment changes, you have a real problem because you are, if the environment changes, your model is old and based on the old version of the environment and you're doing a lot of updates based on an incorrect model. Thank you. Yeah. Any last questions before we break for the day? Yeah, I have one more question. Sure. Dave. So uh, if we define planning as going from a model to a policy, is it possible to skip learning the values and just go directly to the policy? So there are, and we're not going to be covering in this class, uh, some policy gradient approaches where if you basically have a loss function, you can, um, you can, uh, you can come up with a policy directly without having value functions, yes, so that's possible. But that's true not, uh, I'm trying to remember where that's true with model free as well. It's certainly true with, yeah, with model based, one can do that. So there are, are ways that you can directly uh, uh, try and code or improve a policy without getting intermediate values. Because if you're able to do that, I see that as like a way of getting rid of like one source of uncertainty, which is like learning Q values from the model. If you're able to go in a more direct route from the model to the... That's true, yeah. So we are gonna have a guest uh, lecture, I believe it's next week, coming up, uh, which uh, Erin, who, um, that's her, her field, is model-based reinforcement learning. So she'll uh, uh, expand on this, I think, quite a bit, I hope. All right, so, uh, I will see you guys on Monday. The program assignment is due on Friday. The homework is up. If you got the homework early today, refresh the schedule page because I actually removed one problem. So um, I think there are, there's one fewer problem than there was early today. Any last questions? Otherwise I will say goodbye and I will stay in this meeting until 3.30, available for office hours, okay? All right. Bye-bye.